Um, just like always, y'all turn your cell phones off. I'll let y'all scramble around and get those turned off. I can't find mine. Oh, you know where it's at. Wherever it is, I hope it's off. Okay. But if y'all would get your cell phones off. I really don't care. You know, they ran the same. <laughs> I deal with it all the time. <laughs> she put you to that teacher. That's right. <laughs> Everybody got all that done? We still got a little bit of time if y'all wanted to grab something else to eat. I know some of you came in a little bit late. Um, and y'all can get that while I'm, I'm talking a little bit. Um, this, we've got one more program before our summer break. And our next program is going to be May 11th. And that's going to be Mr. Marcus Wren. Marcus, you want to stand up and holler out what it's going to be about? <laughs> Sides of my family have been in Webster Parish for over 150 years. So I'm going to talk on my mother's side of the family was the Spencers, and they were real pioneers in Webster Parish. In fact, the first 40 acres of land that they bought, grandmother and grandpa together cut that timber on that 40 acres of land with a hand axe, piled it, and burned it, and planted the crop between the stumps. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> But y'all don't forget that's going to be our last one before our summer break. And then in September, I know uh, Kyle asked me earlier, when is our big fundraiser? And that's always in September. Uh, so y'all be looking forward to that. If you have things that you would like to donate, items, services, dinners at your home, camps, <coughs> hunting trips, Anything you might can think of that will bring some money, uh, we're going to start taking things now. We need lots of, lots of items for our solid auction. Uh, so y'all be thinking on that. Um, one of the things, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this project that John Agan and I are working on right now, and it's turned into to really a heck of a project. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Ty's over there shaking his head like, yep. <laughs> But uh, there's so much history in Minden and Webster Parish, but there's so much of it out there at the Minden Cemetery. And I spend so much time at the cemetery. I'm out there at least three or four days a week checking on stuff out there. And um, I talked to John. John had mentioned one time that he wasn't going to write any more books, and well, I went into a panic. And I was thinking, no, no, that can't happen because he's got all this in his head and I've got to get all that <laughs> on paper. So we started this project and, and I'm not saying every single person that's in the Menden Cemetery is going to be in the books. It's going to be probably at least four books now. Right now, uh, today, we're up to how many pages, John? 350? 350 something pages right now. And so each book will be about 250 pages. Uh, maybe a little bit longer than that. So it's just going to be about like that. We're going to start on the old section first and get at least two books out of that. Then we'll start on the new side. And it's probably three books at least on the new side, if not more. So if you have family pictures that you don't think we have, we need those. We need to scan those in because we're taking pictures of the headstones, putting pictures of the people, the houses that the people lived in. We're trying to pull it all together. So it's going to be a really, really interesting book. I've learned that everybody in Menden is related somehow. <laughs> so, it's, 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 it's very interesting. It's very confusing at times, but uh, I, think, I think I'm getting the hang of it. But this is the cover of the first first book, and you may recognize a relative or two. Harmon, I know you will there. If I could see you, I would. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but this is the uh, cover for the first book. The second book is similar to this, uh, but with some different photographs in there. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's a project uh, that we are working on. And while, while uh, Ty Pendergrass is here, I'm going to give Ty a little plug. Ty is the one that handles the Menden Cemetery stuff. He probably doesn't want anybody to know that. But, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so much for that anonymity. Um, 
If you're not on our mailing list for the Menden Cemetery, you need to get with Ann Harlan so that she can put you on the mailing list. Uh, Ty, you might, you want to stand up and just give them a little overview on how we don't have any money and... <laughs> <laughs> Um, since you put me on the spot, uh, really Thad should be the one that gets up and speaks up. He's the one who got me in this job. So, <laughs> uh, but anyway, the Dominion Cemetery uh, has been in existence since 1850. Isn't that correct? 1840. 1840s. And um, at some time, I think in the 50s, uh, a group of people here in town, leading citizens, got together and, and formed the Dominion Cemetery Association to try to provide a way for the cemetery to be maintained on a perpetual basis. Uh, Roy and Abnett uh, was one of those people. Um, Harry Andrus was one of those people. Weston Miller, they, you know, they, and according to Roy and Abnett, they raised so much money in the 1960s, they were embarrassed. <laughs> and they quit. You know, they raised about 200000 and quit, which is about uh, 400000 short of, of where they needed to stop. So each year the cemetery uh, sends out a mailing and along with a, some funds from the city, um, you know, we try to, you know, maintain the cemetery. There's 30 acres out there of headstones. And if you think about what it takes to weed it and mow around 30 acres of, of tombstones, it's, a, it's an expensive inch. It costs about 35000 a year and we're raising about half that. And the rest we're having to take from the principal of our investments. And so, uh, you know, we need some help at the cemetery. But there is a lot of history and it's, uh, it's fascinating to walk around out there and, and see about what's happened and I appreciate Shelley's and John's interest in trying to help us and, and, all, and so many of you help as well. We appreciate that. But as, as I said, that cemetery, that's where all of our history is at. It's, it's out there and we just can't let that go and not get repaired and things that need to be done out there. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind if you do have uh, relatives that are buried out there. And even if you don't, I mean, I don't, Ty doesn't, uh, you know, but I'm very passionate about the cemetery. Uh, so, so think about it as well as this. Same thing with, with the museum, you know, if, if you're, most of you are on our mailing list because you're here tonight. Uh, but it, same thing, it takes money to run it, uh, lots of money to do the things that we'd like to do. So it's, it's a way of us preserving all of our history, and it's very important. It's very important to me. Anyway, John, I, some people, you know, are not as passionate about history as others are, but uh, we have some people that come in every now and then that are just amazed at what a nice museum we had. I had quite a few uh, out-of-town people this month, just, just tons of them. I don't know why they were here, but, <laughs> but we had a lot of out-of-town people coming through uh, this month. So they, they just amazed at what a nice uh, small town museum that we have. I'm gonna let um, Thad introduce our guest speakers since he's probably known them longer than, than most. Probably since they were born. I guess, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. It, it's a real privilege for me to introduce Susan Ross and Chrissy Keating uh, today. But I first was introduced to their parents somewhere around 1938, 39, 40 in there. They were living down at the high tax apartment. <coughs> And my mother and father walked down the street and we got to their house. That when the Dietrichs came out, well, immediately I knew my parents thought they were nice people. They were somebody special. That was my, that's a rare first introduction, but, but that was the way that my parents felt about them. And through the years, I know why they, they thought that. They, uh, they both did many wonderful things. Uh, Warren was certainly an important civic leader in Michigan and was, always had new projects, new things that he wanted uh, to do for the city and he got them done uh, too because I uh, worked with him in the Episcopal Church and I uh, worked on the planning commission and, and the Chamber of Commerce because Warren was complaining the last time that 
shoot, I, I don't hear with my grandchildren's age group there, but he kept on going and he did a wonderful job. Uh, of course, these young girls here, uh, they, they, they're going to tell, uh, that they shouldn't have too hard a story because you've got wonderful people to talk about. So, Chrissy and Susan, it's a great pleasure to have you here to present you. Thank you. Thank you. Didn't want to, want to be buried in the cemetery, the old cemetery, but she didn't know where all the beautiful old boxwoods were. Mm -hmm. So she ended up being at St. John's Church, but she loved that old cemetery. So I'm going to encourage y'all to support the cemetery uh, as well because it's a beautiful place with a lot of our friends who are there and uh, we love to go visit them. Let me take it from there. Okay, guys. <laughs> I just want to say this. There are hundreds of pictures of the three of us growing up and in the back uh, and in the, the back well i'm talking about early on early. <laughs> and almost every one of them they're laughing and i'm crying <laughs> what did they do <laughs> <laughs> i'm scarred <laughs> we didn't put the bad time picture in okay good okay we're good all right uh, uh, that's the way we feel about everybody here there's somebody that we are friends with but our history did not start 200 years ago, it was only started about 80 years ago. And mother and daddy came to Memphis, Louisiana. And so um, before we start, I wanted to tell you, this has been an adventure. And if you can't hear me, wave your hand and I will speak up because I'm a teacher. I can get that across. Um, that uh, Susan and I uh, started doing this after Coralie talked to us. And I'm writing notes in Menden and she's talking to me from Baton Rouge. And so we go down there, and after, oh, she came up here in January, and we pulled out some pictures and reminisced. And the problem with that is that you go through every picture that Mother has saved, which was every event in our lives through everything that the grandchildren have done, plus. And uh, so we, get, we got kind of bogged down in some of those. But, but then I went to Baton Rouge last week for Easter, and after Easter, we spent Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday together. <laughs> and I can say quietly that it was two great minds on two different wavelengths. <laughs> so anyway, and learning to make a PowerPoint on a Mac computer is quite a challenge. <laughs> and we had lots of help. In fact, today we were even calling somebody in Baton Rouge. Well, which button do we push? You know, so again, that's how we uh, started our, uh, our whole thing on Mother and Daddy. The story of Sue and D, and, and D was nicknamed D because I think George and Harry and John McKinnis started calling him D for Dietrich, like Mr. D and it went to D. So we call him Sue and D, and I, I call, we call him Mother and Daddy, but the grandchildren were Sue and D. And it started far from Minden. Daddy was a New Orleans boy. Um, he was the third son of Christine and E.G. Dietrich, who were uh, from, their families were from Alsace-Lorraine. And uh, so they were French. <coughs> they were Alsatians. I don't want to say French-German. She wants to pitch me every time I say that. So anyway. Um, That's and, how the war was going. <laughs> yeah, was a bit, yeah. <laughs> Well, they got moved back and forth, I'll say, so I did. But anyway, he grew up in New Orleans and attended Warren Eastern High School and wanted to go to Tulane. That was his dream, to go to Tulane. He told us he had always wanted to be a doctor. Now, picture that one. And this changed because when he was young, I think around 17, he contracted tuberculosis. And he was um, bedridden for several years or because of it. And the doctor said when it's time to go to college, he needed to go be in a field that got him outside some. So doctoring was not his choice. So he decided to go into forestry. And then off to LSU he went because that was the school that had the forestry. He did recollect that he did not spend much time outside during those four years of college. And uh, that he did a lot of studying and things like that. And he did graduate magna cum, no, cum laude from in the School of the Forestry. And, he often reminded the two of us what a good student he was. <laughs> we didn't quite follow in that exact footstep, but anyway. Um, Dad's father was known as E.G. 
<clears throat> his name was Emil Gabriel, but he hated Gabriel, so he wanted to be called E.G. And he worked for the United Fruit Company in New Orleans. And uh, I remember going down to the wharves. Can you, if you can hear it, let me know. Going down to the wharves um, in New Orleans and watching them unload bananas. And Dad said that he ate so many bananas as a youngster, he was not so much fond of bananas <laughs> later on. So that was one of the things he uh, let us know. Another story about his growing up years was he and his brothers, he had two brothers, Oliver and Norman, and they liked to play tricks. And uh, one of the things he did was they soaked the streetcar tracks. They greased them, soaked them, something. Anyway, and they waited around to watch the excitement of the next streetcar that came by. And uh, unfortunately, the person on the next streetcar was my grandfather. <laughs> and uh, E.G. got off that streetcar, calling their names. And I think they stayed in trouble for quite a while after that one. Um, now, Sue D. was born in southern Arkansas, real close to the Webster Parish line. And she had a younger brother named Ray. And her mother was Edna Wynn Sanders, who was the best cook I ever knew, even over my mother, because she made all the things I liked. And uh, my grandfather was Chester J. Sanders. And they moved to Northwestern Webster Parish, I guess, as they married, and had a farm, I think a cotton farm, because we have a recollection that Sue says she remembers one day that she went out to the fields and there was a farm hand that was picking cotton and she, he said, come ride my sack, little sissy. And she was called sissy, she didn't like that either. But, uh, and so I can just picture my mother riding a cotton sack. You know, doesn't fit her very much, but anyway, she didn't like to be a, a farm girl. So anyway, she came to Minden after she went to, I think, Magnolia, Southern Magnolia, Southern Arkansas University, and uh, lived with Abner and Lillian Turner down in the corner of Broadway, and I don't know what the little short street is, but uh, down there, and their daughter, Virginia Lill. So I guess they, they it was uh, uh, a friendship that they made, and she stayed there with them. Other friends that we remember her talking about were Claire Wheelis. Lee McIntyre, who they nicknamed Carrot Top, and I'm assuming she had red hair, and Claire McInnes, Isabel and Flavia Leary, and uh, I don't remember many others of the young people, but those are the ones I remember the most that she uh, uh, remembered and talked about in her younger years. Now, this is before Dad came to Minden. She also went to, that was them, she went to Cuba with the uh, Leary sisters. And that's one of the Leary sisters right there. And uh, Susan told me that going to Cuba at that time was quite the thing to do in the 30s. So uh, uh, that even our grandparents, Tina and E.G., went on trips to Cuba. And so that was well, quite an adventurous thing for her to do. So then Dad comes to Menden to work for the Soil Conservation Company. Before that, he was at the Bogaloo the paper mill and Bogalusa, and then he was in Mississippi at the forestry, in some kind of forestry place, but he came here for soil conservation. Um, he said, when he got off the train at the train station, thanks to John A.M., we have this picture, he, it was one scared little boy coming from New Orleans and walking up that tall hill by the Minuteman <laughs> to Minden, all without knowing anybody or anything. So he lived in a rooming house on Fort Street, right across from the Irvings, and um, lived there, and I guess that was when Mother and Daddy eventually met. The soil conservation job then led him to the party company, and that was the job that he had while we were growing up. Uh, the party company was a uh, family-owned business that had land in Louisiana, and uh, he, uh, they were from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I, I don't know how he got, they got in touch with him or how he got the job, but anyway, he became their land agent and manager of all their property, which was a, quite a big property. Sue and Dee met and courted, 
And then uh, World War II was imminent. <clears throat> and I remember that Dee told me he tried to list and got turned down. And Susan didn't know that, but um, he tried to get in the Air Force and they turned him down because of his tuberculosis. And so he and Sue Dee married eight days after Pearl Harbor. And in January, he was um, drafted. The Army decided that if he could marry Sue Dee, he could get in the <laughs> Susan's going to tell us a little bit about the history of World War II because that's her expertise. That's her expertise. <coughs> okay. This is a story. This is a story that Daddy told me. You can't hear me. I can't talk his last cuisine, but I'm going to try. This is a story that Dee told me. Um, I think when St. John's was doing a memorial or reminiscence of World War II about night. Uh, when the, the 60th anniversary came along, and I sat down with Daddy, and we went over uh, what he could remember uh, about World War II. And so these are in his, his remembrances. And he was drafted in 1942, in January of 1942. Um, and then uh, he went to Grady Gray, who was the head of the draft board, uh, and that was located right across the street from the People's Bank. And he walked in as a civilian and walked out in an army outfit and in charge of his group. Uh, then he went on to Camp Claiborne in Pineville and he was moved to the 330th Engineers because he said he knew what a camp a compass was. He knew how to tell the records. Uh, Sudi came to visit and of course brought him new decent khakis because she didn't like what he had. So she wanted to make sure he had, was top notch. And then he went on to Fort Belvoir, Virginia. Uh, he was a 90-day wonder. Uh, he uh, went in as, you know, 90-day wonders went, uh, learned all they need to do to become an officer. So he went in as an uh, enlisted man and came out as a second lieutenant. And Kate Smith was the graduation in, uh, entertainment. And Sudi bought him a captain's cap that we were told was better than most higher ups had because she had to go by the best captain's cap. Uh, he returned to Menden for Thanksgiving in 1942 and was assigned to the 10th Court of Embarkation. Uh, and he went to Camp Stoneman in San Francisco and was there until the spring of 1943 when he, the unit was alerted for overseas movement. And at that time, uh, Claire and Harry McKinnis were in San Francisco. Uh, Harry was uh, a Navy man. And he visited with them, and we have some cute pictures of that, but uh, they're kind of buried. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, next stop was Camp Shanks in New York, and he was prepared for foreign service uh, insurance, uh, wills, inoculations. Um, and on April 22, 1943, the 10th Port was ready to go to New York City to board the Army transport, the Edmund B. Alexander and they all loaded the ship as the band played over there. Um, he said it's quite an experience. He was a little nervous about the ship, thought, oh my gosh. Uh, but this is one of the largest convoys to set sail from the United States. And the final destination was Iran. And then arriving in Iran in May of 1943, and onward to Arzu, which is close to Iran, 25 miles to another port, and that's where he had his first contact with the Germans in the air raids. Uh, in 1943, he said, we moved to a railhead at St. Barb where we boarded onto rail cars so overcrowded we were so glad to get off. And they selected an olive grove for a bivouac area. And he said, our job was to take an active part in the operation about to get underway, the mounting of the Seventh Army for the Sicilian invasion. He said the honeymoon was definitely over. Air raids were every night and explosions were severe. Um, on, July, on July the 10th, invasions began. The 10th Port was redesignated as the, uh, the Seventh Army under the command of General Patton. And the next stop was Palermo, Sicily, uh, where they were to operate the port of Palermo and handle all the unloading of ships supplying the army. Uh, that was singled out as the most efficient in the North African theater. Um, and Dad met Patton in a convoy and witnessed the mule incident in the, in the movie. Uh, and then he watched as Patton ordered the haystacks to be burned because the Italians were hiding 
guns in the haystacks. But the best story is, as I remember, and Dad told it, was uh, they were, Dad was in charge of uh, a unit to repair the tracks and to aid in transporting ammunition to Naples. And the Italian conductor ran the train back to back like this with all this ammunition on board. Dad grabbed him, and if you know D, you can imagine, grabbed him and gave him a swift boot. And here comes General Patton. And uh, at that moment, General Patton arrived, saluted, Dad was scared to death, saluted him and said, carry on, soldier. <laughs> so uh, after that, after the, uh, after the war ended, Dan went to uh, Switzerland and bought a Rolex, which we still have today. But his favorite song, and he used to whistle this, I remember as a little girl, was Please Mr. Truman. I wish I could sing it. He let, let the boys go home. We had conquered Naples and uh, liberated Rome. We have subdued the master race. There are no crowds for us to face. Oh, please let us go home and let the boys at home see Rome. This is mother um, at Christmas um, when Dad was in North Carolina. This is our aunt um, during the war. I think I'll let Chrissy tell you that Chrissy and Sydney made several trips to New Orleans. And this is Sydney at, at Aunt Lil's. And there's Dee's picture, and I think that's particularly touching because all these women were home, managing the, the home front. And these uh, men were over fighting for our liberties. And, and um, here's the in front of the Vatican, and you can just imagine him wanting really to come home. He left uh, the army as a captain, and they wanted him to stay and become a major, and he said, no, thank you. <laughs> I want to come home and come to Memphis. So, um, and here's, uh, during the war, this is Harry Jeter, with grandma and grandmother Glass, his name is Claire. That's Claire. And then, here we go. Okay, that is uh, Sydney and Susan and Harmon and Little Harmon. Hold your applause. <laughs> okay. Ooh. Um, a lot of our pictures are kind of out of sync because we got ahead a little difficulty putting them in the right order. So we'll have to flip back and forth. While at war, CD worked at the Louisiana Ordnance Plant as personnel director. The secretary pool called her that cat because she could walk into an area and they wouldn't know she was there and they would be talking and she would kind of clear her voice to tell them get back to work. But one of them said, oh, she's not such a cat. She's just a kitten. And so her friends called her Miss Kitty for a while. Uh, and you saw the picture of uh, Aunt Helen. She would visit New Orleans on occasion to see Dad's family. There it is. Aunt Helen was in New Orleans. Sudik visited her. That was one of Dad's brother's wives. And uh, then also she visited with Claire a lot. And um, I was told that Harry was quite the spoiled child because everybody wanted to hold Harry. So he was not put down much as an infant uh, <laughs> while all of the men were away. After the war, they moved to the high tower apartments on college and Susan was born. And um, as Thad told you, he remembers meeting them at the High Tower Apartments, which are the corner of Union and College, right across from the high school. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. the fourplex, yeah, yeah, the fourplex. And they were upstairs, and the Englishes lived downstairs. And Mother told the story that if Susan was crying, she would just turn the radio up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And finally, it got so loud that Oogie would come upstairs and pick up Susan and carry her back to her apartment for a while. <laughs> you know, and um, Oogie English was called Oogie because Susan couldn't say whatever her name was. I don't remember what it was now. But we're still friends with their, that family. Um, <clears throat> so and the other besides that, and um, besides Harry and Treaty on college, Marie and Robert Watkins, Judge Watkins, lived in the big red house right there across from Men and High. And uh, a friendship began there. And after that, uh, everybody was home. Uncle Mac, Harry McKinnis, I called him Uncle Mac, Big Joe McKinnis, Daddy and Rob Watkins got together and Rob had some land and they developed Watkins Subdivision, which is Bay Creek Road today. And uh, it's named Bay Creek Road because of all the bay trees there. In case you've never noticed, um, they have a sort of silver leaf on one side and not on the other. 
And of course, knowing that he was a forester, he told us all about the plants. <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, the Bay, Bay Creek Red was uh, developed. And <clears throat> Harry Mack, John McInnes, and Dad all picked separate lots, not knowing which one they liked, and numbered it one, two, and three. And it stayed that way because we had four, five, six, seven, and nine, eight, nine later on until 911, where they had to change it to another number. Uh, I, I, Susan didn't say I needed to say this, but I'm going to anyway. Rosalie still has, Rosalie's house still has a two on it, and I think Claire's house still has a three on it. And I still have stationery that has a one on it, so, and, and I still think of it as one Bay Creek Road. Uh, so we had Lee Bay up there and developed me. That's me, I was born. And we moved when I was uh, three months old to Bay Creek Road. Um, and Philip was born right at that time, so Philip's only three months younger than I. And uh, we had a, a, other families were John Bitten and Frank Treat and John Watkins and Lamar Foster. And uh, Susan and I talked about it, and all of the other children agree that we had quite an idyllic childhood on Bay Creek Road. We were free to roam from house to house going in to almost any house without announcing or anything like that and uh, enjoyed that freedom. Um, the children, the McKinnis boys, both families, that's four of them, the big boys, Johnny and Charlie, Carolyn wasn't born until a little bit later, and then Tommy was born when they moved to Drake Drive. Barbara and Pete Treat, uh, and we all played over Bay Creek Road and pretty much dominated what was happening. It was go slow because the children are out. This is a picture of us, I think, in front of Claire and Harris. Yeah. And that Chrissy is wearing um, a bonnet that Sudi bought on Bourbon Street. It's a French organdy bonnet with blue stays. And she, I wore it. And we she pinched me. That's why I'm crying. Um, then, um, then the mother said she would never tell Daddy how much it cost. So but we, we have the remnants of the bonnet today. It's and all the girls, Susan's three girls and Christine, all wore that bonnet. Or I had their pictures made. I had their pictures made. They didn't wear it for very long. But anyway, uh, anyway, so okay. All right. Go on and drop, jump in anytime. Okay, Barbara, Susan, and I would spend hours building straw houses in the front yard. Not with the snow, but. Not with the snow. Okay, that was the snow. I don't know what you got up there. Snow. We, we don't have it very coordinated. Anyway, and um, we would build them all on Saturday and play in them on Sunday. And if we just make the outline of a house, and we would run through the walls and I mean do everything that you know like a house. And then on Monday we would come home from school and it would be gone. Daddy said it made it so much easier for Luther or Cleveland, whoever was working for him at the time, to rake up all those leaves because we had already done it for him. But he said, "Don't worry, there'll be plenty more straw next weekend." And there was, and we'd do it again, and then it'd be gone again. So, well, we love this picture of the snow. That was in 19. Or 50, 52, I think. And then we had a couple other snows, but this is a huge snow. And uh, when I found it, I thought I'd have to include this slide. I think I'm the person in the wagon because I remember saying to Mother, I'm thieving, Mama. I'm thieving. Just <laughs> take me inside. <laughs> so, anyway, George and Susan and Barbara and I used to practice our driving on Bakery Road. Bakery Road is a private drive, so we had no regulations out there. And we decided we must have gotten pretty good at driving because you had to go because the roads are still very narrow out there. And uh, not much room for anybody to pass. And all of my friends know not much room to park either. So um, Saturday nights were, we found ourselves at Harry McInnes's house, or they at our house, the two couples. Where are you now? Oh, this is a picture of the, the woods, the swamp. And that's um, Rob Watkins' house. John Watkins' house. So, uh, and it was a, it's a lot clearer than it is now. So anyway, but uh, we would stay at, the, at either house and visit and have, they'd have dinner. And I remember them having the radio on. Of course, y'all realize TV didn't come until a lot later. And we would dance, they would be dancing and I'd wanna dance so I'd get on dad's toes and he'd waltz me around. The other thing I remember much about that time is that when it was bedtime, they put Philip and I to bed and Uncle Mac would come in and tell us very rabbit stories. Now, the, Susan was in there every now and then, but not often, you know, age has its privileges. They got to stay up a little bit later. Sundays, and we would find us visiting at Treaties and Harry's after church. And that's me with Mother and Daddy, and then Susan's in the next picture. 
up to church. We were over at the entrances quite a bit, I remember. Um, now, the other part of our family, you know, we didn't, we don't have, when y'all talk about everybody's related in Minden, well, we were not related to anybody in Minden, but the Andrews's were our family, and so were the Willard Roberts, and so were the Edgar Hands, and so were the Drews, and so were the McKinnises. So everybody was uncle and whoever, they were all very, we were all very close. And every Thanksgiving, we spent Thanksgiving with Willard Roberts and his family, Lila, Elizabeth, Anna, and Edward Hands, and Rick sometimes, at different homes. And uh, we enjoyed that so much. And every day, year, we had a tradition that we would go walking after lunch. Well, lunch was never served till after two, and sometimes after four. But anyway, we would go walking, and if it was raining, Edgar would open up the skating rink in downtown Minden. Y'all remember it? Yeah. Some of y'all remember it? And so that we could skate. Skate. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that was uh, one of our Thanksgiving traditions. But again, we were very close to uh, those three families in everything we did. It seemed like, and still pretty close to those families. So I uh, find them near and dear friends. Uh, Christmas traditions that we had. Are we going up to that? I'm going to find that now. Okay, she'll go find it. Anyway, uh, we always were at home because Grandmother Sanders would come stay with us. But on Christmas Eve, for years, Treby had a, and Harry had a party. All right, are you there? Okay, okay, that's the Christmas tree. Just hang on to that one right now. All right, uh, and we were very privileged because we got to be invited, the two of us, plus the Roberts girls. I think Treby really had us come to take coats at the door. But anyway, we loved it, and we were the young people that were invited. That's Susan and Jim Johnson. And if you'll now, she's quite grown up at that point. But. And there's um, Mr. Stewart Thad in the background. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right there. And then the next one is um, Thad, Thad and, and, they, and Susan is right here. And there's Willard Robinson over there in the background. Yeah. So, but uh, anyway, we got to go, and we thought we were the best and the most important people in the whole wide world to be able to go there. Uh, back to the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree at our house was always very skinny. And uh, Dad would sometimes take branches off the bottom and usurp them in the center, hang them, or do something to make them look a little fuller. And uh, we always laughed that we had the skinniest Christmas tree. And there we are with the Anders children. Is that right? We got Western, Elizabeth and Laura. Laura, and then Elizabeth right there on the Christmas. That's a pretty skinny tree. tree. And if you've ever been in the living room, you know exactly where that was in that corner. And that corner's a big corner. That's a skinny tree. Uh, after grandmother died, Susan and I had both married at that time, and we started going to Baton Rouge for Christmas, all of us together. And it was quite uh, an adventure to have all of us in the same house. But uh, we started a tradition then of sitting on the stairs uh, for the children had to sit on the stairs before they could go into the living room for Christmas morning. And uh, this is them quite old, but we started when they were about, Susanna, who is right there, uh, was about nine, I think, when we started this. Now finally they've gotten so big, Jeff is Susanna's husband, and nobody else was married at the time. So uh, we had another picture another year with Ainsley and her husband, and we had another picture with two grand, great-grandchildren in it. And then they refused. They said, we're no longer sitting on that stair anymore. <laughs> but we still try to get them there, but they don't want to sit on the stair. But anyway, that is one of our traditions. And we have a whole book of them sitting on the stairs at every age. And I actually had a painting done as far as for Susan for Christmas. I don't know how much she appreciated it, but um, <laughs> them sitting on the stairs. I think it's hidden in a closet, but that's OK. <laughs> is that true? It's true. <laughs> Okay, so the other thing about Sudie, of course, many of y'all know she was a great cook. And um, she loved Julia Charles. Is that right? Julia Charles. She loved to cook anything that they had and uh, often entertained people and uh, had parties for brides, brunches. Dad said he had housemaid's knee when she had these because he'd always have to help clean up. And, um, but uh, she had the bishops over every time they were here from visiting. And um, then later on, when Susie found out she had cholesterol, she didn't eat as much anymore. 
And Julia Gillum, who worked for her for a while, said there was nothing in our house but lettuce. <laughs> nothing in that house but lettuce. And how Daddy existed during that time, I don't know. Uh, Susan and I, growing up, were on a short leash, as Harmon and Richard and John Collins would know, is that Dad gave us 15 minutes after any function yeah. to get home. Yeah. It didn't make any difference whether it was choir practice, youth group, going to Marjorie, I mean, the Playhouse, Hunter's Playhouse to dance, 15 minutes, right. and you had to be home. And if you weren't home, he was waiting for you. And not many of us like that. Also, uh, Susan, Susan and I, neither one of us had a car in high school, except for one brief moment I did, and I will get to that. When we drove Mother's car, we never could drive the company car, always Mother's, Dad decided he wanted to keep up with how much gas we were using. <laughs> so he made us go to two separate filling stations. One was Mims and Patterson, downtown Minden. That was the one we used to go to, right next to Andrus Motors. And that was where Frank Tree had his office, uh, senior, had his office. And we would go in and fill up. And I would, uh, a friend of mine used to sign her tickets just with her name, so I just write Chrissy across a uh, ticket for mine. But the other one was McCreary's when it was down the corner of Lewis Road. And, um, but that was so we could keep up with how much gas we were actually using. Susan and I would volunteer to go on errands to the store so we get five minutes outside the house to do what we wanted to do. We wanted to. Quickest trip around the Dairy Queen you ever saw. Anyway, so um, that was one of the things. But now my, my one brief moment of a car, Susan's in college, and Daddy brought a repo home from the bank. And it was a Volkswagen. It was standard. And I was not... And, um, didn't know how to drive one. So we went out and he taught me how to drive one. And I didn't kill it the first day. So the second day I thought I was good enough and I said, Dad, can I take it to show Connie McLemore? Who is Connie Brown? Y'all know Ronnie Connie. She lived in Sibley. He says, no, she lives outside of Minden City Limits. So I said, okay, can I go to the library? And you know what I did, right? Straight out to Sibley. Well, he checked on me at the library and I went there and then I got home. And that car was gone the next day. <laughs> I didn't get another one until I was a senior in college. And at that time, he told me I couldn't leave the Baton Rouge city limits. At least I have a little bit more area to go before I can hide myself. But anyway, so that was one of the things we did. We decided that he was dead serious about rules. And we had to learn to follow them. Sue D's activities included, are you going there, Vera? That's an entertainment. Included uh, taking care of us and our school events and Girl Scouts, and uh, she was a big Girl Scout leader. I don't know where you are. There you are. That's Susan's group of Girl Scouts with uh, Ms. Phillips mm -hmm. in front of the Presbyterian Church. So anyway, I, I don't know all the ladies. Susan is next to Mother. Anna is Tom. That's Jan Aldridge. Yeah. And then Jane, who's that next door? Jane Longbridge. Lily Beth Franklin, is that who you, and that's? Lily Beth right here. And that's e. Maureen. Yeah. E. Yeah. yeah. So she was very big in the Girl Scouts, but she was also big in flower shows. And she, she did flower arrangements, not all for flower shows, but for everything else, it seems like. She and Rosalie McKinnis and Sally Treat and Claire, we're always doing flower shows. And this one is, has Alvern in it. Alvern's in it. That's Claire and Mother Alvern. So, and here's another one. And that's another one she did. So, I didn't quite get that talent. <laughs> I didn't get any talent, actually. <laughs> Only talking loud is my talent. All right, so she also was in the Junior Service League. And Susan says, Remember the Follies, the Rockettes. I don't remember the Follies, but I got to see a picture of them. They actually had a thing, and they all danced, and they had the Absolutely. mesh tights on and the high heels and everything else and to raise money. And they were very big in the Association for Retarded Children, which is not called that any longer, but at the time it was. And that was due to their relationship with Edgar and Pat Hands, whose son, Rick, was a special needs child. Uh, she was very involved in the women of the church. She did the altar guild, flowers on the altar, polishing brass and ironing the very ladies. And she polished brass way on the up until she was, until dad was sick, I think. It was, she, that would be her one job she could do. 
And they, I think they remember her walking on her inner heels because she always wore heels. The clip top of her heels. This was the women of the church when Gladys uh, Williams was leaving, I think. And uh, it was a, a farewell party for Milton and Gladys and all the girls. And it tells you who they are if you need to know. Any of y'all probably can see it better than I can.
there's a couple, the last picture is another few camellias that we took from his uh, garden in January. She had to go around the rose leaves to get to the camellia bushes because could, she couldn't go through my jungle. So anyway, <laughs> Susan and I always sat in the back seat and had to jungle, juggle plants between our legs and around and everything else. On our vacations, we were always taken to gardens. <laughs> Belly Breath Garden was one, there we are. We all, I remember we have fond memories of going to Hodges Gardens when Daddy had, was very good friends with the Hodgeses. And when we traveled to New Orleans or anywhere, we got the uh, lecture of whose land that is and whose land that is and whose trees those are. And, um, and we had to listen because there wasn't anything else for us to do. So <laughs> we did. Anyway, we learned about all the pine trees there. And Susan and I both remember that and I don't pass driving anywhere, even on all my trips to Streetport, every time they cut timber, I notice it's cut, I notice if it's clear cut, and I notice when it's replanted and it starts growing again. And I notice all the logging trucks and I think, where are they going and where did they come from? And how big are the, uh, the, the pines? And you know, he was instrumental in getting pine made into to plywood, wasn't he? Yes. And, and that was one of the things. They were very heavily involved in St. John's, and Dad was a Sunday school teacher for years and years and years. And uh, besides all the things that Mother did, uh, he was a lay reader, which meant that he helped with the service. And then later on, he became a chalice bearer, which is when they have communion, he would handle the chalice. He was so nervous, he always made sure we were the first ones that had communion, because if he was going to spill it, he would <coughs> spill it on us. So uh, then, uh, uh, he taught others, and Cleo is a uh, student of Daddy's in the uh, learning to handle the chalice and doing her the, the altar duties or whatever. Um, he was on the vestry and had of it many times. He and Harry Andrus and others were picked to go to the diocese's meetings in New Orleans most of the time when Louisiana had only one diocese, one group. And uh, Mother and Trigby went along because they got to go shopping and having lunch and doing those things. But they had great fun all the time they were there. Um, more fun than, more fun than yeah, yeah, even being at the church. So Dad was head of the day school when St. John's had a day school. And I believe Lisa Campbell was a member of that day school. And she got into some trouble that she was, uh, I read it in the history book, that she was had got sent to the a corner or something like that. And then she kind of wandered down the hall and started visiting with the minister, who was Bob Park. And uh, they finally found out that it was better just to put her in the corner than to let her wander too far. <laughs> anyway, uh, Ms. O'Dell and Ms. Creighton were the head of that. And also, Rowanne was uh, always there to help. She was uh, very helpful at St. John's early on. I think that kindergarten just covered four and five-year-olds. And Dad was head of it, of course, always, and because education was important. And he always was at the church making sure the grass was cut, the flowers were blooming, the, and anything else that they needed at the church, he would be there doing. And um, I remember once Treby was standing out in front of the church, uh, this was early on, and she said, um, wouldn't it be nice if there was a tree there? And Daddy said, Treby, if Harry will let me have his wrecker, I can get you a tree. She looked at Harry and says, Harry, Warren needs your wrecker. And the next week, the tree was there. And so, it's still there. And it's still there. <laughs> There's also a tree in front of Byron, Mr. Phillips' house on the corner of East and West in Louisville. And Dad planted a tree from him. Mr. Uh, Phillips wanted, Mr. John Phillips, did I say that? Wanted a beautiful tree that would be beautiful in the fall. And I think it's a black gum. So he right. called it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a black gum. And Daddy planted that tree for John Phillips, who's a longtime senior warden of St. John's. So. Anyway, all right, after his death, we arranged a scholarship for the young children, for the children at St. John's in Dad's name. And then they, we also helped fund the new youth building for St. John's, and there's a room known as the Dietrich room there for him. All right, so back to Daddy coming to the party company. I'm going backwards again because there was not a way to stop talking about him at one point. He said that he came, he was in the party company, but he was interested in making his place in Minden. 
which he did. He said he wanted to be a big fish in a little pond. And that was true. One of the best friends was Cecil, Cecil Campbell, and John Campbell gave this story that uh, they lived, uh, everybody's, their offices were in the Longino building at the time, and Cecil would call dad, or dad would call Cecil every